We will reread Exodus 6, 9. And Moses spake so unto the children of Israel, but they hearkened not unto Moses for anguish of spirit and for cruel bondage. The first eight verses that we heard read during our scripture reading, uh, in those first eight verses, God reiterates to Moses God's message, his message of deliverance for the children of Israel. And here in our text we see, and Moses spake so. Moses spoke accordingly. The best Moses could do is just say so. Say exactly what God said. Um, Really as preachers, teachers of the word of God, even when we are to testify, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If you have been saved, tell of what the Lord has done. Uh, the best we can do is, uh, is tell God's word. It's the word that uh, spoke the world into existence. We cannot improve on that. So we see that Moses spake so, spoke a word of deliverance, but in the same text, our text, verse 9, and nine we, see that, uh, we see the audience's response to God's message. They did not listen and believe the message because it says of anguish of spirit or because of their broken spirit and for cruel bondage or because of the harsh slavery that they were and the oppression they were in, uh, suffering with. Because they felt so discouraged, so defeated, so demoralized, Because their bondage had become so extremely uh, oppressive, the children of Israel lost all hope uh, of things ever changing. So this is the second time the children of Israel hear the message from Moses, God's message. But after what had just happened, which we will review, um, it seemed easier for them to accept defeat to accept bondage. They didn't believe, they didn't heed, they didn't respond, they didn't trust Moses and the message from God ultimately. So as we navigate through this text, this verse, that's our main text, is falls in the middle of a narrative, beautiful narrative of how God uh, worked through Moses and eventually uh, communicated to Moses and then Moses to the people and eventually brought a uh, uh, tremendous delivery, uh, del- deliverance for the children of Israel. But as we navigate through this text this morning, there's three things that stand out to me, and I uh, will refer to them as we go. One is God's message. Two is God's messenger. And God's audience. And then as an extension of that, the audience responds to God's message. So first of all, God's message we see is a clear message of love, of mercy, of redemption, of deliverance, of freedom. God's message is independent of the messenger. This was not Moses' idea and Moses' message or Aaron's message. This was not um, Aaron's idea. This was not uh, of man. God's message is independent of the audience. In other words, it's not affected. God's message is not affected by the audience's response or feedback. Sometimes, especially when we testify of what the Lord's done or try to witness to somebody or or even as a preacher or especially as a preacher, if we don't see a response, we could be tempted to wonder, is there something wrong with the message? There's nothing wrong with the message. God's message is pure and powerful and life-changing. No matter, it's independent of the messenger and independence of the audience or the audience response. The message is directly from the Almighty God. God's message reveals God's purposes and God's plans. They're not man's words. It's God's message is God's pure word, powerful word that breathes life. So that's God's message. God's messenger in this case is Moses, who was called to be the, deliver, uh, the message 
um, messenger of the love wrench. We all, and we'll see the parallel, we all are called, if we've been saved from sin, we have been called to be messengers, to tell the world that Jesus came to save, that God offers deliverance. So the messenger is necessary because God has chosen, chosen it so. We have a role or a part to play. So the messenger is necessary, but it's important to recognize that the messenger is never as important as the message. Why? Because it's God's message. Um, sometimes people are more focused on the messenger than on the message. Third, God's audience. And of course, in our text, we see one response to, uh, from the audience to the message. But God's audience, in this case, were the Hebrew children, the Hebrew people that were under, under Egyptian bondage and oppression. The children of Israel were in desperate need. They were in desperate need of deliverance. But ultimately, God's audience is all humanity. And as we study the Bible, we see that actually Egypt and, uh, is a type of sin or the bondage in Egypt and Pharaoh, the oppressor, is the devil and, and sin. So, th so when we think of being delivered from Egypt, we're being delivered from sin as the, the type. And Moses is the messenger. In that sense, Christ is the messenger. And, and as we look through the narrative and we see ultimately there's a Passover lamb, Christ is also, also that Passover, Passover lamb that died that we might be free. So let's first look back. If we go back to chapter 3, um, verse 7 and 8, we see God's message that was originally given to Moses at the burning bush. And the Lord said, so the Lord appears to Moses in a burning bush, and the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. That's wonderful to know that God knows our sorrows. He knows the oppression. He knows the uh, captivity that humanity finds itself in. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Who's going to deliver? Notice. God says, I am come down. That's a type of Christ. Christ has come down to deliver. So, so the Lord says, I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land unto a good land and a large unto a land flowing with milk and honey. That's a type of heaven, uh, eternal life. Christ has come down to deliver us from the Egyptians, if you will, from the, from the bondage of sin and to take us to heaven, to land that, that it flows with milk and honey. Verse 9, we, we, we read, I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Verse 10, come now therefore, he's talking to Moses, Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, and thou, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel. So the, basically the, the message is to Moses, God says. Moses, you go and deliver the message. You be the mouthpiece, Moses, but I will deliver. Yes, you need to be an instrument. Uh, you need to lead them. But no, you're not going to do this. I will do it. You just go tell them the message. I am come down to deliver, just like Jesus has come down to deliver all humanity. So Moses reacts, we're, so now we're contrasting between the message and the messenger. Moses reacts to God's call to be a messenger, obviously with trepidation, with fear, anxiety, and he raises a number of objections. I went through this process with God. I raised all the objections in the world why I am not fit to, uh, to answer the call to be a messenger for Christ. Moses tells the Lord, Lord, who am I? <laughs> I'm a nobody. Lord, they will not believe me, nor listen to my voice. And the Lord assures them, I will certainly be with thee and will help you. And in fact, he says right off up front, he says, you, as a testimony of this promise and, and the reality of what I will do, you will be returned to this mountain with the people of God and worship here. 
God graciously walks Moses through his objections to assure him that God will help him. And that's what God will do to you and to me. He calls us. We, none of us feel worthy. Uh, but if he has saved us, why well, he says, I need you to be a witness to others. Others are longing and crying out to God, longing for deliverance. And they don't know how to ever break those cycles of sin and of, and of bondage. And I need you to witness, to tell them that Jesus saves. So uh, the Lord tells Moses, Moses, throw down your rod. And the rod becomes a serpent. Picks it back up, becomes a staff again or a rod. Put your hand in your bosom. When he takes it out, it's full of leprosy, white as snow. Puts it back in, comes back healed. He continues and t tells them, Lord, uh, the Lord tells them, if, if they don't believe you, take water from the river and pour it upon the dry land, and the water shall become blood. Well, Moses, you know, it takes time. When we get, first of all, there has to be a call for, from God. And rest assured, there is a call from God. If you've been saved, God calls you. I don't have to convince you of that, do I? But Moses was not ready to accept the call. And he says, Lord, I am not eloquent, but I am slow of speech. I stutter. That was one of my excuses, too. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm of slow tongue. The Lord replies to Moses, who made your mouth? Now, therefore, go, and I will be thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. I will go with you, Moses. I will speak through you. You just cooperate. Submit yourself. Submit your mouth. Submit your feet. Submit your hand. Submit your will to me, and su submit your entire uh, being and your future to me, and I will go with you and, and speak through you. Well, Moses still struggles. So then the Lord says, I will send Aaron too. You know, sometimes we could use uh, another uh, 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 brother, another sister to help us along. Aren't you glad that we don't have to walk this walk alone? There are times that we walk alone, not alone as in God is not with us. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. But in this Christian life, there's strength in numbers. And we thank God that we can gather and and. Do the will of God together. So initially, when Moses and Aaron deliver God's message to the people, we see this in, verse, in chapter 4, verse 29. Take a look here. Verse 29 through 31. And Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And Aaron, you know, basically God told Moses, okay, if, you have, if you're still concerned about this, you tell, I'll tell you my will. You tell Aaron, and Aaron could tell Pharaoh, or Aaron could tell the people. So they called the elders of the children of Israel together, and Aaron spake all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses, and did the signs in the sight of the people, and noticed the response of the audience. And the people believed when they heard and the Lord, that the Lord had visited the children of Israel, and that he had looked upon their affliction, that they bowed their hand, then they bowed their heads and worship. And I thought, what a contrast. Right here, the message that was delivered was received by the audience. What a contrast between how the people react here versus two chapters later in our text, where they didn't believe or re receive the message. You know, there are people that receive the gospel me message joyfully initially. But when persecution comes, when resistance comes, they get discouraged and give up. Initially, there may be excitement. Initially, there may, there may, there may be a sense of adventure. Uh, and it may be popular. So people can respond. And I think of that in our in our church organization as we have our special or combined meetings with our other uh, brothers and sisters in Christ or our camp meeting where you see there's a large crowd of people embracing the will of God. It's popular. 
And here, initially, it sounded adventurous. And why, of course, we believe and we'll, we'll, we'll embrace this call. But what happens when it becomes apparent that this is war? That there's an enemy that will oppose you the moment you declare your name, yourself with the name of the Lord. The, the moment you declare yourself, you side with Christ. You'll find out that there's an enemy that will, will raise a, a resistance or opposition. So in chapter 5, uh, we read, it begins with Moses and Aaron delivering God's message to Pharaoh. Thus saith the Lord. There's, there it goes again. That's the, the messenger. All we have to do is say, thus saith the Lord. Let my people go. Well, you know the story that Pharaoh doesn't take well to this message. Who is the Lord? Why should I obey him and let Israel go? And in fact, we read that Pharaoh responds on making life harder for the Israelites. He gave orders to the slave drivers to uh, not give the people straw that they were using to make bricks. And they were expecting now to gather their own straw and make the same amount of bricks as before. And if they didn't, they were beaten for not producing as much as before. Satan does not take well. When God begins to work on a heart and wants to deliver him from sin, you need to recognize, we need to recognize, remember that the Satan's going to not let a sinner go without a fight. He'll put up a fight before a person's saved and after. We have an enemy that, that, that wants to destroy us. The, enemy, the Son of Man came to give life and that we might have it more abundantly. But Satan came to kill, to steal, and to destroy. He's out for keeps. So, the people go to Pharaoh and inquire why the harsher punishment. And they find out it was because of Moses' message from God. And chapter 5 concludes with the people returning from Pharaoh and confronting Moses and Aaron. And we read this in verse 21. And they said unto them, to Moses and to Aaron, The Lord look upon you and judge, because ye have made our Savior to be abhorred in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of his servants, to put a sword in their hand to slay us. In other words, the people now turn, when, when Pharaoh makes things harder for them, they turn on Moses and Aaron and they say, it's your fault. May God judge you. You made Pharaoh hate us more. You were morally wrong. May God judge you, Moses. Had you kept your mouth shut, we would have been better off. We should have never listened to you, Moses. You put our lives in danger by bringing your message that caused persecution. You know, we need to be careful as believers to not allow Satan to divide us. To get our eyes on the messenger instead of realizing that there's an enemy trying to destroy the soul. Sometimes the messenger gets blamed when it's actually the devil just simply putting up a fight. The, the devil puts up, the enemy of our soul, Pharaoh, if you will, puts up a fight not only to keep those in bondage, but even to the messenger. If you declare your, your, yourself as a servant of the Lord uh, uh, Jesus Christ, and you have been saved from sin, and you have endeavored to tell the story, rest assured that the enemy is not going to sit back and let you do that without a fight. So Moses responds like every believer and minister should. Go to the Lord. Take your burden to the Lord. Amen. Tell him your real emotions, your raw emotions. You won't shock God. Kind of interesting. Verse 22 of chapter uh, 5. Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Lord, wherefore hast thou so evil entreated this people? Why is it thou, that thou hast sent me? Why did you send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he hath done evil to this people. 
And then notice this, he says, neither has thou delivered thy people at all. And, you know, I, I did my job. I came and told them, but you didn't even deliver. So now Moses is kind of struggling. Lord, where are you? I, I was trying to do what was right. And in, instead things are going worse. I trusted you, Lord. And things, instead of getting better, they seem to be getting worse. Trust God and trust his message. So, that bring, brings us to chap, beginning of chapter 6, which we read, where the Lord responds to Moses' question or raw emotions and thoughts. And the Lord tells Moses, I am the Lord. I made a covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I've heard the people's cry. I remember the covenant of, of your fathers. I will redeem you with a stretched out arm. I will deliver my people from bondage. I will take them to the promised land. I will take you to be my people and, and, for, you to be my, and for me to be your God. So Moses reiterates this. Again, we just covered that in the beginning of the message. This message from God that God will deliver. But verse 9 in our text, we see that they hearken not because of anguish of spirit. They were demoralized. We believed you once, and look what happened. The words were wonderful. Words of encouragement, promises of God. But the last time we listened to you, Moses, things got worse. Sometimes, and we need to understand the process Process that, that we walk through, if you will. God doesn't need much time. He can deliver instantly. But he needs us to be at a place where we can trust him and surrender to him. And in that process where we learn how to get ourselves out of the way or to repent of our sins, to let go and to break uh, our allegiance to Satan and to, to yield our hearts to God, in that time or process when the enemy is wrestling for our soul, we must realize that sometimes there may be silence. Sometimes things, uh, God may not be moving at our t in our timing, but rest assured that what God said he will do. So God's message does not change when Satan puts up a fight when, or when persecution arises or when the audience is discouraged or refuses to listen. Verse 10, the next verse after our text, we see the Lord spake unto Moses saying, Go in. Speak unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, that he let the children of Israel go out of his land. What's God's message to Moses? Moses, preach again. Tell them again. Testify again. Keep living right again. They don't respond. That's because that's whatever's going on there is between them and God. But you just trust me, Moses. All who have been saved, I've said this already, are called to be messengers for Christ. To pass along the message of deliverance to the people. And we must not give up. We must not be discouraged or deterred from declaring the message of deliverance from sin. We must keep sharing. No matter what the opposition is or what the response is. I would rather that people run to the altars and surrender their lives to Christ. I've had people say at times, and I've heard other pre preachers, pastors say this, but, you know, I really enjoyed your message. I would rather that you just obey and do what God's word says than to pat me on the back. Though I do want to be appreciated by you, but that's secondary or far, far uh, past the priorities because it's not about the messenger. The message is what's important and responding to the message. We must keep focused on the message from our Lord and Savior. Amen. It's his plan. Right. We keep our eyes on Calvary. Amen. The passion that God had for souls of humanity. Mm -hmm. He went to great length to deliver, to transform lives, to heal the soul from sin. Mm -hmm. Sin is what destru uh, destructs lives marriages, homes. And again, in verse 12 of Exodus 6, we see Moses responds by presenting his case to the Lord 
when now the Lord tells him, go to, go to Pharaoh. And he says, Moses spake before the Lord, saying, Behold, the children of Israel have not hearkened unto me. How then shall Pharaoh hear me? If your children, the children of Israel, have not listened to me, how is Pharaoh going to listen to me? And then I love God's response. In verse 13, the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron and gave them a charge, gave them a commandment unto the children. And he said, gave them a charge unto the children of Israel and unto Pharaoh king of Egypt to bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. In other words, he gave them a commandment, do it. We might say, paraphrase it, I've commanded you now, go, Moses. You have your marching orders. Go and, and lead my people out of bondage. All we need is God's authority. The word of God is our authority. The message from God is our authority. This word of God is our authority. It's life-giving. And the more we stay right to what thus said the Lord, the more power there is in it. There's danger when we try to water it down or, or tr change it or soften it to make people feel good or comfortable. Think about this. What if Moses went to the people and watered down the message or corrupted the message? Instead of saying, God sent me, God has come down to deliver you from bondage, what if Moses just gave him more of a feel-good message? Something like, I know that Pharaoh is, is your taskmaster and and you're in bondage, and the bondage is awful. But just know God loves you. God knows how you feel. We like to know that God loves and God knows how, how we feel. God, know that God hears your cry. He understands your oppression. How, good, how much good does that do if, if you're left there? When they had cried for deliverance, he can help you feel better in your oppression. And of course, God can do all these things. Just practice having a positive attitude. What if Moses told them that? Just give me your money and God will help you get a promotion amongst the slaves. What if that was the message from Moses? Seems silly. But no, they long for deliverance. Our soul cries out from, uh, for, for deliverance from the bondage of sin. And the message of Jesus Christ is that Jesus came. To deliver, in fact, if I can read it. First of all, John 8, uh, 24, Jesus said, Whosoever committeth sin is a servant of sin. Whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. And that, I don't have to convince you of that. Uh, uh, sin and slaves. People try to break their uh, sinful habits and they can't. Uh, it's, it's oppressive. But here's 1 John 3, 8. This is the message of the gospel. And nine, he that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. But now, here's the beautiful part, the parallel, or the, the picture of, of God telling Moses, I have come down. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. Or for this purpose, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, came down. That he might destroy the works of the devil. That's 1 John 3, 8. And then he goes on and says, verse 9, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. The message of deliverance is Jesus is the Savior. He's come down to deliver. You know, when we don't see response, like I said, we could... And it's, it's, it's important to stop and evaluate. Am I delivering the message of God? So any, and you need to, you and I both need to always evaluate the messenger against the message. And, the, and we have the source right here. And we ought to, whenever you hear the word of God preached or taught, challenge yourself. Don't settle for a preacher's word or some YouTube vi video. Go to the word of God yourself and see what does it say? Because these words are alive and life-giving. So, as we conclude, God's message today is still a message of love, of mercy, of redemption or deliverance. You can be free from your sins. You can be changed from the inside out. Christ came so we can be saved 
so we can be born again, so we can be made a new creature in Christ Jesus. The message of God is pure, powerful, and life-changing because it's the message from the Almighty God. If you have been saved, the message today is God still calls messengers, still calls you and me to tell others, to tell of the life-changing message of the gospel. We may not be called to be missionaries or to lead a whole nation out of bondage. No, just, just tell your family. Just, just tell your employees or, empl- or coworkers. Just share with your neighbors. Just, just share with those you come in contact with. Jesus can change your life. You will never be the same. And again, the other application is God's audience is all humanity. He speaks to all of us. May we this morning respond to the message from the Lord. Perhaps if God has spoken to you and challenged you, either if you're not saved, he offers you forgiveness and salvation. But if you are saved, perhaps perhaps God is calling you. You need to speak up. You need to answer the call to be a missionary or a, a servant Uh, or a, a messenger from me.